what's amazing is these, these lectures are actually pretty darn independent of each other, um, uh, except for that little thing. The one thing to know, and that is what the, a quaternion product is. It's just the, the scalars multiplied together, the dot minus the dot product, like, it, like happens with uh, complex numbers, and then the scalar times a vector, vector times a scalar, and then the cross. And that's it. Okay, so uh, we're going to do a little uh, speedy review of what we covered uh, yesterday. Uh, what I said yesterday was that I was a lunchbox physicist, and it says, oh, how beautiful and simple it all is. How could we have missed it for so long? And claimed that what I was really trying to do was, was to put time and space together. Now, I'm going to give you something new out of that. Like, there's a big problem out there with the arrow of time. Actually, it's, it's not a new problem. It was around since Boltzmann's day. And um, to me, the question is posed incorrectly. Because if you have a problem with time, I'm going to go by you in a, in a spaceship, and I'm going to have now a problem with space-time. Because time is going to rotate in space, and now it's no longer a pure question of the arrow of time, it's the arrow of space-time. And so, is there a problem with an arrow of space-time? And it's like, well, the space part has got pointy fingers to it. And I can actually get a little bit more technical than that. I can show you the, the look. Well, actually, th this is so s small, it's, it's easy to do. The, 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 the rents transformation for doing that has got, it looks like this. And, you know, it doesn't matter how many times you hit things back and forth, it, it'll, it'll still be the same matrix, you'll still get the same results, you can play ping pong back and forth with flipping time forever. That's their arrow of time problem, okay? Now, if you try and do the same thing with the quaternion, an ever so slightly little bit of the cross product creeps in, <laughs> That's the handedness, and that solves the arrow of space-time, which, as I say, is a diff different from the arrow of time problem, but that's because I think the arrow of time problem is, um, is not the way to go. Okay, so um, now we'll, we'll kind of uh, step through the slides, uh, and we'll start with a, uh, an executive summary, so we make this very simple. Executives <coughs> like simple. Oh, great. I forgot. Uh, let me just go back. I, I've got to have my amp on. You guys can hear this. Okay, so what we did was we went, we went over numbers, you know, thinking about the terms in terms of numbers. We showed you a little bit of algebra. Uh, we did a lot of equations, and I did have uh, a few words, a uh, few words to say about it all. Okay, so um, let me just make sure something's going on. Okay, that's great. Um, no, we don't want to hear it twice. <laughs> okay, all right. So now we look at the um, the linking of the math to the words, and we've got Euler Lagrange somehow getting us from uh, the back, what's written on the back of the t-shirt to the front of the t-shirt. Um, I do have these little index cards uh, that I'm trying to give away just because if you do happen to wear the shirt, um, it might be a little frustrating. I've been in a situation where I say, well, you see that, <laughs> it doesn't work. Um, but if you had a card, you can say, well, you know, this little part here is about the symmetry of, uh, uh, of light and the weak force and the strong force and, you know, anyway. So this is really an aid uh, if, if you decide to wear the t-shirt and hope to try and explain things. Okay, so um, then it was the idea of merging complex numbers, scalars, and vectors using both I squared equals positive 1 and I squared equals minus 1 for... Um, for hyper-complex and, and complex numbers, uh, respectively. Or I should say, quaternions. All right, so in these, this was the graph theory that I came up with for uh, quaternions and hyper-complex numbers, uh, where the, the, the little play balls are vertices, and the edges are labeled, um, and, and they've got to go like i and minus i to kind of uh, get back and forth, and then the plane 
is where it gets uh, confusing because it's the, it's the cross product. But hypercomplex is, is easier and simpler, uh, and that's related to gravity. So then we uh, went ahead and uh, derived uh, the Euler-Lagrange uh, equation. And I don't think the person who corrected me is uh, a return, but uh, I corrected the notes. And I just wanted to thank her. Um, and even though that looks really, really scary, uh, we notice patterns like the DADZ is going straight across there, and we've got all these duplicate sorts of things. So maybe we can deal with uh, all those terms. Uh, we looked at Lorentz invariance, and I identified four that are on the back of, uh, of the t-shirt. And then we went ahead and derived, in the, the right way, uh, all four Maxwell uh, equations. Uh, the first column is for E dot B, and it gives us the, uh, the no monopoles in Faraday's law. And what's kind of neat about this graph is, is you can almost kind of think about how each one of those terms is used. It's one of these things like, oh, this must, in Faraday's law, this must be the, the, the E term, and this must be the cross term. But this, this, this example must be for uh, X. This must be the EX. And then we'll have, have this thing shift down from EY and shift down. And then those other boxes will shift around and we'll cover everybody. So, this is another way I'm trying to communicate the completeness of what Maxwell has done. Uh, and then we've got um, Gauss's law, which uses this B squared minus E squared Lagrangian, where the Bs are separate from the E, so they're not mixing together and, and crossing each other, uh, stamping each other's out. Then we went ahead and did um, did the, what I'm calling, calling the G-field. This is only about gravity, where everything flips signs in this Lagrange density except the cross terms. And we end up with, uh, with Newton's law down there. Um, rho equals you know, the Laplace of, of, of the scalar field. And a time-dependent one. And that's very, very vital, uh, because it means that the time-dependent change in, in, in uh, the mass density has time to propagate and be consistent with special relativity. Then I moved on to what's covered on the t-shirt. That would be the, the gem field equations. Uh, and I call it an uber modern uh, Laplace's equation. So we're trying to do so much more than just say, well, it's just this one, one thing going on. And the math is actually easy, which is kind of nice. OK, so then I gave you a, a flavor of group theory. Um, and this one here has, I claim, uh, U1 symmetry, SU2 symmetry, SU3 symmetry. And in a certain way, it's really about, um, uh, about unit spheres in space time. We even made it out to the issue of spin, uh, which is somewhat remarkable. Um, and I was able to uh, at least show you, uh, I'll give you a, a sense of um, the angular momentum spin projection operator if I use jargon. And if I don't use jargon, I just said I got a zero <laughs> for the imaginary part because my two things canceled. And if you look at the uh, coefficients, one of them had a bunch of ones, uh, and another one they added up. And the, the ones that add up are spin two. Uh, and that's the symmetric curl, the ones that kind of look like they're canceling each other, they, there are only ones involved, and uh, that's curl, and uh, that's connected to EVM. And then uh, sprinting hard at the end, uh, we said that the uh, exponential metric um, was, was a solution to uh, my uber-modern uh, field equations, and um, I think it's prettier, because it is exponential, and exponentials seem to dominate the world because they're, they combine both doing absolutely nothing and doing a little bit of oscillation. And that's actually been an important uh, kind of philosophical change that I've had is I've always thought about physics as doing a lot, but it's like, you know, the universe uh, is like 13 billion years old, you know, and if something is around <coughs> after 13 billion years, it must be like, basically doing almost nothing. And the key is, what is the smallest possible step from doing almost nothing? 
And I think that's what fundamental physics is, is really studying. So that is the review of what we covered uh, yesterday. So I wasn't here, but can I ask one question? So absolutely. And by the way, anybody should do what this man's doing right now. <laughs> so on the shirt it says no stinking hates, which implies <laughs> that, that you've got SU2 and SU3 in there, or SU2 in particular. Uh, can you go over that again? Because I didn't see the SU2 signature. I did not review that. Uh, no, I, I had SU2 symmetry in there. No, the, the no sticking Higgs was that um, was because there's a gauge field in this. Oh, I need this. I need this part. Actually, I need a feature. Unfortunately, I have a few. <coughs> okay. Um, it's larger than my All right. So um, the no sticking Higgs is 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 based on a, a, an essential trick that happens in the standard model. You've got three symmetries, U1, SU2, SU3. In a certain sense, you need to preserve those. If you don't preserve them, what it means is that those charges are no longer conserved. If those things are no longer conserved, then some experimentalist is going to show you wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Because they actually do have experiments that show electric charges conserved to a super huge uh, uh, degree of accuracy. So, the way standard physicists do it is they say, that vacuum, that vacuum is a false vacuum, and when I break <coughs> symmetry from that, that's how some of these particles gain mass. Okay? I use them, uh, I don't use that technique. Okay? My vacuum is completely real. <laughs> There's nothing false about the vacuums that I work on. I think a vacuum really accomplishes nothing. Okay? Which turns out, ironically enough, to be radical these days. Because everybody uses the, the, the vacuum to get stuff done that they don't understand at this time. I'm going to hold the position that if I don't understand it, that's fine, but the vacuum will never explain anything in the universe other than like, like the um, volume shift. Yeah? Sorry, how do you explain electro Electros, uh, I don't think I do at this point. I, mean, I what I do, what, what I, what I do, what I do on the t-shirt, what I do on the t-shirt is say, um, this, this term right here, this, uh, this holding the t-shirt, is there any engagement to explain why No, 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 no. This is what I'm doing. It's a, it's a slicker trick than that. Um, this, this stuff with, with the, um, with the hyper complex product that has a gauge field. Sure. So, so this thing has a gauge field. I think this is related to things that are that that deal with gravity. This thing also has a gauge field. Okay. So this also applies to things with mass. Uh, really but, but. But this is a plus and this is a minus. So the two gauge fields exactly cancel. I see the notion of how you explain spontaneous, how you can justify the way that spontaneous justify all the experiments that you throw out. No, what I'm throwing at, no, the one that I'm trying to throw out is the Higgs part. There is no data for the Higgs. No, but there is data for the fact that we don't use I know, and I'm consistent with that because this equation has uh, has a gauge field. Yes, okay, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. It's just that this gauge field exactly cancels that other gauge field. It's that I have two gauge fields. One for the standard model stuff and one for gravity. That's probably where I bring it in. There's a gauge field for gravity. And it's the gauge field for gravity that cancels the gauge field for the other three forces. Is that closer? Is it closer to making sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, what we're going to do now is uh, try to address the question uh, why quantum mechanics uh, is weird. And there are a variety of schools for, for, for this. Um, 
And in fact, I went to a talk by Max Tedmark where he took a vote on what people preferred, which is kind of funny, right? To, to me, that's a sure indication that physicists haven't settled on an answer, okay? And in fact, in this group, it was at Harvard University, um, uh, it was um, the Copenhagen got no votes. It was like, wow, the Copenhagen interpretation really uh, is, is not popular. Oh, who was it? Who was, who was the other guy? Oh, my brain's going uh, low or dry. What? Everett? Yes, yes. Everett got a lot of votes. Um, and uh, so did, oh, who was the other person? Yeah. Ah, anyway. Um, but it was kind of curious that Copenhagen got no votes. But, but we're, so we're, physicists still are not at peace. And I, I, I said, I do have a different answer, uh, and I'm going to go through uh, the logic of my, my thing. And the, what it is, is that if you do quaternion calculus correctly, uh, then I think that provides a new answer uh, to why, uh, to this old question. Uh, so, what, is quantum mechanics weird? These are probably the most famous quotes out there. I don't know, maybe I, I will read it, yeah, just whatever. So from Niels Bohr, it says, for those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum theory uh, cannot possibly have understood it. More modernly, uh, Richard Feynman says, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. And then Albert Einstein said something like, you know, God does not play dice with the cosmos, and Niels Bohr retorted, do not presume to tell God what to do. <laughs> And Groucho Marx even had a comment in there, very interesting theory, it makes no <laughs> sense at all. <laughs> uh, so I thought, we, I thought we'd go a little bit deeper in, in a Richard Feynman, since I have so much respect for him. Uh, we have always had a great deal of difficulty understanding the worldview of quantum mechanics represents. At least I do, because I'm old enough man uh, that I haven't gotten to the point where the stuff is obvious to me. Okay, I still get nervous with it. I don't, I, uh, uh, you know how it is, always is. Every new idea, it takes a generation or two becomes, before it becomes obvious that there's no real problem. I can't define the real problem, therefore I suspect there's no real problem, but I'm not sure there's a, not a real problem. So I think that's nice because it shows the tension uh, in his mind. And let's face it, this guy won a Nobel Prize for QED. So he, he was good at quantum mechanics, and yet there was there was like a pee under this pile of mattresses that he was sensitive enough to still feel uh, at that age. And and based on, uh, I don't think we've solved it uh, to this day. So the problem, just to define it, is yes. the um, non-unitarity of quantum collapse, is that fair? I would say that's uh, probably too technical an, an, an answer. I mean, it, 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 maybe that's a way to look at it. Um, I think it's like things like the uncertainty principle. It's like, how, how does that really work? Why, why is that there? I think it's almost as simple as that. Uh, but if you start to get into Dirac's equation, you go, What's a creation and an annihilation operator really doing? Explain that to grandma. <laughs> I might explain it to a graduate student in physics, but not grandma. Okay, so um, I'm arguing basically that quantum mechanics is still weird uh, today. Um, Einstein, I think his views are, everybody wants to say, Einstein thought just like I did. It's like, no, no. <laughs> that's not the case. Um, I, I read a very, very good, uh, uh, The Subtle is the Lord is a, is a wonderful book um, about Einstein and his philosophy and actual science. And, and he, was, he was impressed uh, with, with what they did. You know, the, the Bohr atom was, was just spot on. Um, but Einstein thought a lot about causality. Why did this happen? How could this have happened? And that's, I think, I think that's the, the, the P under his collection of, of mattresses, is what is different about causality for quantum mechanics uh, than, than classical. 
I mean, classically, A happens, then B happens, and C happens. Okay. Um, well, this is a little picture of, uh, of what goes on. Uh, that only the sum of all possible histories says what happened in quantum mechanics. So there's this guy looking at the moon that's bouncing off of the lake. And um, if you actually decide to, to focus on just one path, you'll get that signal. You know, that, it might not happen very often, but it will happen. But if you go ahead and calculate what happened, what you need to do is out of every single one of those, you'll notice that one of those actually happens a lot more often. It's, uh, it's not destructive sort of thing. Um, but you must include them all. And that, in essence, is kind of odd. Uh, I gave this one kind of its own space. And that is that the math of quantum mechanics is flawless. It's used to make the most precise calculations out there. So I'm not challenging uh, that issue. Because it's not an issue. <laughs> it's great math. And it's like, you now when we get away from the philosophers, you know, and we just say, we've got to do these calculations, everybody's uh, with the program about how it is done. So my list of the largest two new math ideas generated over the entire history of physics is calculus by Newton and space-time by Einstein. And I probably should give Minkowski credit because he was the guy, he was his math teacher, and said, you know, you're really rotating time into space here. All right, so I'm going to try and smash <coughs> the two biggest ideas together to make Copernican space-time calculus. And I take this right out of my, my calculus book from, uh, from, from the day, and it just doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work because quaternions do not commute. So should I write that DQ on the left, or should I write it on the right? Now, there are professional math wonks who work with quaternion derivatives on the left, or maybe they do it on the right. I don't know which is actually more popular in the literature. But either one I consider a disaster because, uh, for technical reasons, they can't show that Q squared is analytically Q and it's like, well, then why bother? If you, can't, if you can't figure out the polynomials, you can't figure out anything. If you can figure out the polynomials, you can figure out everything. So um, I consider it a complete tra train wreck. And um, so I thought about an alternative. Um, it's, it's basically the three vector part of the, the, of the differential element um, that goes into the cross product. It's the cross product that makes it not commute. So why don't I just make that go away? By being clever here, I'm going to take two limits, one after the other. I'm going to first let the problem child go to zero, and then I'm going to let the time go to zero. Okay? That's a well-defined sort of animal. And it's kind of a, it's a variation on Lasky Cow's rule, which I always consider a little miracle when I first learned it about taking two two limits in order to get something that actually is invalid. So after after dr has gone to zero, dt the dt part commutes, and so maybe it doesn't matter if I write it on the left or I write it on the right as long as I use two limits just like this. Um, so we're going to test it. We've got this function uh, q squared, and we're going to use that, uh, the, the limit definitions. And uh, I don't know if you uh, remember those calculations from, uh, I don't ho hopefully you did those in high school or something. Uh, but uh, it, it's kind of fun to see them actually kind of work out. So the first one, uh, first line I just say, okay, I've got q and I'm adding in my dt, my, my differential element. I'm divide, and I'm subtracting off the Q without out the differential element. Um, and I'm dividing it, maybe on the left or the right. Um, that wouldn't make a difference at this point. Um, but now I just kind of crank through that multiplication, and I've got Q, the differential element, and then the differential element Q. At this point, they are different. 
And then when I let the r actually go to zero, then um, it does, that, that this guy right here, it doesn't matter whether I write him on the left or the right, because he's just a real number. And since he's the inverse of that, he's going to cancel that one. He's going to cancel that one. I'm going to end up with exactly dq, um, 2 dq, um, and a differential element. And so when d, dt goes to uh, 0, I just get dq. I mean, that's, that's what you expected. <laughs> OK? But it required this two-limit trick. If that two-limit trick isn't there, it does not work. OK, so with our physics hat on, OK, we say if, if dr really being a change in space is uh, less than c dt, then things are traveling at less than the speed of light. OK? And so in a certain sense, I, I think of mathematical physics as being a little bit more constrained than, than math is. Um, it, well, because, yeah, that's, that's a kind of more you know, philosophical sort of thing. Um, and I, I call this a time-like derivative. And only by me, this isn't like, I, I know I've had some people who, who do, uh, we're doing reviews of quaternion derivatives that are out there in the in journals. And uh, actually twice people have said, you know, I, I happen to stumble upon your definition. And I, I really liked it because it was really simple. You know, and it seemed to work. Um, where those things got published, I have no idea. Um, but I, yeah, anyway, so, so that's that story. Uh, but then you go, um, well, what, how about the other case? What happens if the change in space is larger than your changes in uh, time? Then don't I like have a problem? It's like, yeah, you do. <laughs> that guy, what can I conceivably do with that? That's still going to have this, uh, this, this, this cross product problem. Okay? Uh, that doesn't, shouldn't, shouldn't nature also use that situation? And I think the answer is yes. Okay? But how does it use it? And this was my idea to say that the norm actually does not depend on the cross product. It doesn't show up there. Okay? So if I take the norm of these derivatives, that is well defined. If it's written on the left or it's written on the right, the norm will be the same. So you may not have dealt with norms of derivatives back in high school or even in college, but I mean, it should be OK. You're going to get less information, though, right? You're just going to get the size of that change. Uh, you're, not, you're not going to get a sense of its direction. But this is all you can do, is, is my perspective. So uh, uh, we'll test on the same function, OK? Now, the first two lines, there's really no difference except the order of the, the limits, OK? Then you write it out, and you go, oh, OK. So now I don't have time around anymore. I just have um, these, these sorts of uh, these, these terms here. And he's like, well, how did you get go from line three to line four? The way I did that is I said, well, I'm just dealing with norms. And the way norms work is the norm of one uh, times the norm of the other just equals you know, the product it goes to. It's just really, really that simple. So I'm taking the norm of that uh, the, the, the one over uh, r thing. And when I take the norm, it will just be a real value. It will just be a, 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 a scalar value. So I can commute the norm of that, that thing. And if I uh, commute the norm of that thing, then, um, then I'll, I'll be able to get a 1 out of there. Right? I'll, be, I'll, be dividing, I'll be dividing the norm of this by the norm of that. Well, that will be 1. And so 1 times that, I'll get, just get the norm of that. I'll just get the norm of that, or 2 times the, the norm of that. And so that's, that's the result there is that, that it's the square root of 2 uh, q star q in the limit. So um, the time-like derivative and the space-like uh, derivatives of the same function 
uh, actually give you uh, different results, which isn't that surprising, right? Because, uh, um, so the different, well, I don't know whether it's surprising or not, but um, what I'm thinking here is that classical physics is, is the normal der derivative where, where, where you, you, you let uh, space go to zero first and then time go to zero. Whereas quantum physics has all these norms showing up because you have to take the norms of all these differences. Um, and as I say, there, I don't think there's a testable difference um, with this definition uh, of, 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 of these issues. And so that's why I don't like get up on a soapbox and bang on it. Um, I mean, I feel warm and fuzzy about it. Uh, but if I don't have an experiment where they can say, hey, if you do this, it'll give this, you this different answer. Um, actually, what I did do was I, I went to that talk by Max Tegmark and um, warned him that I was coming with a, my own approach to it and uh, tried, to do the, uh, tried to do this calculation on a piece of paper. He asked me to actually do it, and I, I wasn't able to, to spin it up. So, um, so, and in fact, one of the things I'm most pleased about from this whole lecture series was, uh, was figuring out not only that one, but, uh, but the uh, calculation there. Uh, that was a new calculation for me. Uh, all right, so, um, and, uh, and, and we'll actually get some visuals of this, uh, amazingly enough. Um, so, so why, haven't we, why haven't we heard about this particular idea? Uh, because it's a mashup of complex numbers, uh, uh, vectors, and the limit de uh, definition of uh, derivatives. Um, and that's a lot of things to mash up. And not enough people work with quaternions in the first place to be that worried about the definition of a quaternion derivative. All right. So now we uh, move on to uh, quaternion uh, quantum field theory demystified. This is actually a uh, book uh, available on Amazon and um, my, uh, my good friend uh, Lowell uh, who's kind of doing research with me, uh, he said, you should read this <laughs> because it's kind of your style of heavy equations, a few words summarizing what it is, and then the next equation, and then the next equation. And um, so I was able to uh, read this in about a week or so. I had taken a full graduate year level uh, class in relativistic quantum field theory, so it was like familiar, but it's like, I hope that I don't have to answer all these questions because I'm probably too rusty, but they were all familiar issues for me. And then I went back and said, okay, now if I was to do this with quaternions, how, how the heck would I do this? And what would my approach be? And it took me uh, three weeks to get through three pages. <laughs> I don't feel bad about that because by that time, he'd already done the uncertainty principle, he'd done uh, uh, Klein-Gordon, he'd done the Schrodinger equation, uh, he had to wrap. So those are really core equations to quantum field theory, and we're going to show you basically uh, that sort of stuff. Um, so I read slowly, but um, it, was, it was a productive process. And, um, all right. and, and out of it came what I'm calling the method. Uh, if I can just switch over modes. Okay, so new methods really rewrite everything that was done in the past. So special relativity, which applies if, if things really are, are moving very quickly, um, you've got time and space, they're, they're, they're four vectors, energy and momentum are four vectors. Uh, and in quantum mechanics, which applies to things that are really super tiny, uh, you've got the correspondence principles, so you can connect stuff that happened in classical physics to quantum mechanics. You've got these complex amplitudes, you have real observables, uh, sort of stuff. Um, that works if and only if things are really small. And so I was saying to myself, well, let's get rid of those, you know, if and only if sort of situations. Let me just write it once and use it whether things are going fast, whether things are going small. I don't want to rewrite anything, okay? 
that was my attitude. Um, so uh, the method, as I'm calling it, um, has just four rules um, to rewrite all equations in field theory. Uh, or I mean, I, maybe I should just say in physics. I probably should just say physics. And I, I, nothing is really radical except being this consistent. Um, and we don't really tolerate breaking rules. And um, not being flexible is actually pretty easy. You just say, well, I didn't do this, so I, I, have, I have to keep on I, uh, redoing things until it's consistent with my rules. Because nature appears to be this rigid, right? <laughs> it's like, I'd like to not you know, deal with gravity today. It's like, no, you, you will always deal with gravity. Uh, nature will never allow you to take a step outside. So rule number one uh, is to keep all four vectors together uh, as quaternions. And I, uh, okay, so examples would be space-time. Okay, we've got this, the time element and the space part, and they're together. And four momentum, the energy and momentum together. And differentials, okay. Turns out that the, this, that's a very simple statement to make. There's nothing apparently radical, and believe me, I'm not gonna get along with all the books I've recommended. <laughs> People like think about energy and not concerning themselves with momentum. Or if they do, they'll put it on the other side. That happens all the time. Um, it will be resisted. And in some ways, I think this is, this, somebody said, what, well, it's, 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 I'm not remembering the quote exactly, maybe uh, quote exactly, but it's something about, isn't it, aren't we lucky that math, and, it, math is, gets along so well with physics? Um, but is there any tension there? And I would argue, actually, after the, the, this kind of talk, that there is some tension. And the tension is that because we're so used to the equal sign, we're so used to saying, I'll put this on the left side, I'll put that on the right side. And do you have any criteria for doing this, making this decision? It's like, criteria? I don't need any criteria. It doesn't matter. Okay? And I think that maybe it does in a certain sense. Um, because it's a deep lesson of, of special relativity. Um, people like to focus on energy and ignore momentum. You know, it's like, oh, well, I'll deal with that if I have to. It's like, no, you have to. Because somebody in a rocket ship is going to look at your equation and they're going to see the energy part, they are going to see the momentum, and if you don't have it written out explicitly, rocket ship man is lost, okay? So that message from special relativity says, I can't do a calculation that only involves energy. Well, a vast majority of what goes on in, in these books are calculations that just involve energy, and um, that little thing uh, bothers me. Okay, rule number two is very easy. Drop all factors of I. <laughs> factors of I are rather popular in uh, quantum mechanics books. But because I'm using quaternions, it's got an I built in. It also has a J built in. It has a K built in. It's, it's nice to have these, these things built in. Um, and what I do is I really no longer try and I stay away from the word imaginary. The, the word imaginary came about as an insult. Right? That was when the people were fighting over whether complex numbers should be used by anybody. Okay? And as we know, complex numbers won out, but in the meantime, you know, the, the, the people trying to knock them down, so those are imaginary. There's nothing imaginary about space. There's nothing imaginary about momentum. There's nothing imaginary about that kind of spatial derivative. Okay? So it, sometimes language helps. Um, if you step away from language that was uh, insightful. I should say maybe as a, a kind of corollary to this, uh, quaternions, some people thought they were really going to be important, and they got into the same kind of super nasty fight. Just quaternions lost. <laughs> so that's why it's not mentioned in any of your technical books except those that have to deal with 3D spatial rotations. Uh, which would be either for rocket scientists or game designers. Uh, those are the only two technical books that will have quaternion, uh, uh, an index element to it, okay? I, in fact, only had one math book that mentioned quaternions once, and I read that, I know, in 1989, and I came back to it in 1997. 
Um, so <laughs> that's, the, that's the only reason I'm giving this talk today. Is that it was mentioned once. And uh, this, is the, this is what's come out uh, since that time. Pretty remarkable. All right. So rule number three, keep all those constants. Uh, write all those factors of uh, C, H, and G. Uh, Feynman was actually a big fan of this. And people today say, no, I'm going to use natural units. I don't have to write it up. Okay? So, um, so that's a kind of difference in, in, um, in attitude. Um, but I think that the, the, the constants actually give you a handle on what's going on. Okay? Um, you know, if there's not a factor of C in there, well, then you can't be really relativistic. If you've got an H bar, hey, maybe you've got quantum mechanics going on. Uh, quantum uh, gravity, uh, relativistic quantum gravity, has a G and an H bar and a C, like, like, uh, like the T-shirt has. So rule number four is uh, that all equations must be made dimensionless. So um, <laughs> this is really, I, I don't want to deal with the French. That's the whole, whole, my whole aim. You know, they've got the kilogram defined in Paris, okay? I love Paris. I love the city. I don't want to go there to find out uh, about the kilogram. Um, so the way you execute this is that you put in only dimensionless things and they're going to stay that way. Okay? They're still dimensionless. They're still dimensionless. You see, and this is one of these kind of, this is actually a little dividing line between physicists and mathematicians. Mathematicians, they're always dealing with dimensionless things. <laughs> you know, everything is, this is a set, you know, and it's got these, you know, collections of numbers. They're always dealing with dimensionless things. That's one of the strengths of their, their, the, the, the hand they play. So we should copy that if we're coming at it from physics. Um, and it's a nice check on things that are done. Now, I have yet to really commit all the... A different way of saying this is I'm using Planck units uh, for everything, or dividing by Planck units for everything. So, so that would be 1 over Planck time. That would be 1 over Planck energy. That would be, uh, that would be Planck... Uh, oh, yeah, look, that's the inverse. That must be Planck time on the end, okay? And um, so you end up writing more uh, and having to look at that wiki page that tells you how to convert all of these uh, units to, to uh, Planckian units. Um, but so they're, they're the set of rules. The only one I think that's truly uh, a lo little odd is the, the, the thing about using quaternions in the first place. Okay? But once you accept that, then drop in factors of i, keep all the constants, make them all dimensions. That's all we're going to do. So who are, we going to, who are we going to subject to this sort of thing? Why not start out with Sir Isaac Newton? He's the one who started all. Okay, so um, what makes Newton's second law just so darn classical and so darn relevant um, to our local world? Um, so here is that second law. Nothing's moving fast, nothing's small. Uh, nothing's amazing. We've got, you know, father equals mother sort of thing. But I was just wondering, uh, in your own opinion, uh, why do you think that equation is just so important? Do you have kind of a, a reason why you think it is? All right. Um, and, you know, it's like, well, it was his second law. He was starting out. It was the thing that, that kind of told us about inertia about how you change inertia around. It seems really basic. But, but can you make it kind of more concrete? Uh, I certainly didn't know how until I did this exercise. Um, and that is, I just used the method. And so I've got a time operator acting on mass times velocity, okay? And I made each one individually dimensionless. And I multiply that, that whole thing. And I think the reason it's so relevant um, to our world is that there's this zero in every single term. You know, I wasn't taking time derivative and a space derivative. I wasn't dealing with velocity and whatever would go in, in the front of that. Uh, and then I just multiply that out. And I do get the, uh, the rocket, uh, riot, rocket science term out of that. Um, which, of course, should formally be included, but most people don't, wanna, uh, don't do rocket science. 
Um, and I also think that um, there's, there's nothing relativistic going on here. You know, because otherwise those zeros wouldn't be there. They would have some value to it. And um, relativistic quantum field theory, you can recognize the equation at, with this generator because every value will be filled in. <laughs> okay? And if you're dealing with classical quantum mechanics, then one of those terms along the, along the way will either have a constant or, or, or a zero. Um, and that's the difference between relativistic quantum field theory, where everybody is really filled into the max, and classical quantum field theory, which makes, you know, is, is kind of a step in between Newton and, uh, and what we've written, uh, 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 a step between relativistic quantum field theory and that Newton equation. Okay, and, um, and it turned out that I used this, this result uh, for my Christmas card this year. Okay, so let me explain my Christmas card. That's an apple falling, and it's, it is gaining twice as much uh, in, in each kind of subsequent step, as it were. And the math is uh, the acceleration of gravity, uh, g, uh, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, times the square root of g, uh, a, uh, a small number, h, a small number, divided by c to the seventh, a large number, <laughs> ends up equaling 4.42 times 10 to the minus 51 as a number. Okay? So it's, it represents exactly the same thing. You could say this is 9.8 meters per second squared acceleration, or you could say it's 4.42 times 10 to the minus 51. This bothered me for a full week. <laughs> I'm so used to my units. Even if I had to go to 32 feet per second squared, I was more comfortable going to the English units than going completely without. It's like, then, then what is it? It's got to be describing the same thing, okay? It's just using different units. Okay, I wiped them out. Okay, but, but why is it so small? I liked it when it was around 10. I liked it like it was okay around 32. Being this small bothered me until I said, hold it. Physics is about my relationship to the cosmos. In the cosmos, I'm sitting on a planet that is stupid joke small. It is nothing compared to the sun. The sun is nothing compared to my galaxy. My galaxy is nothing compared to the whole collection of galaxies that make up the universe. The, Science has told us over and over again, you are nothing. I'm saying that message again, okay? That's all. I'm being consistent with that message. And that's how I kind of said, I, I, I took a step closer to saying, I guess that's okay. I guess that's kind of cool. And it inspired uh, some poetry, and so I'll read that. Uh, and I won't analyze it, because analyzing poetry is probably bad. Uh, like analyzing too. So, gravity written without units, tiny beyond the tiniest tiny, gives weight to mountains and butterflies. Even light bends to this game. Lives lived without words, alive, breathing, being and now, give weight to responsibilities and laughter. Even love bows to life. I uh, sent this card, of course, to friends and family. I do send this card out every year to physicists. I'm, you know, I'm doing social experiments. You know, this is a social experiment. I don't know how much of what I'm saying is true. Uh, I hope it's a lot. <laughs> I certainly can't be certain within my own shoes that it is. I do out outreach through YouTube, uh, through those YouTube videos. This is one of my techniques. I send this card to, uh, to professors. I actually send it to uh, five professors here. Alan Guth, Max Tegmark, uh, Seth Boyd, uh, Paul Joss, and Peter Fisher. These are all people I have approached personally, and, and usually at the end of one of their talks, and say, hi, I've got this new idea, and they were polite, they were professional, and they're busy with their own world, and I haven't suckered them in, if you want to say it that way. They are in their own program. They're extremely busy folks. 
Uh, but that's at least one thing that I do to try and get. So these people, they know of me. I am the weird Christmas card guy. <laughs> and with this body of research, amazingly enough, every year for literally 10 years, no, maybe 15 years, I don't want to think how many years, I've come up, I've generated a card based on my physics research that, uh, that certainly was uh, somewhat unique. I mean, it's kind of crazy I, that, that this, that this mission started, I think, in uh, April or May. And uh, it's really been wonderful, and, and I really like the card for uh, 2010. Don't know what will happen next year. All right. So let's look at the uh, uncertainty principle. Very important. Um, the uncertainty and certainty principles of quantum mechanics um, arise uh, from the move to operators and the product rule of calculus. This is usually not the way it's explained. <laughs> I have a hard time seeing things in the standard way. Um, it's because, you know, the, the, the uh, uncertainty principle, that gets all the press. That's what they have books and conferences on. That's what everybody talks about, okay? And there are actually many schools of thought about why the uh, uncertainty principle exists. Um, but here, uh, the way I like to operate, if I can't map it directly to an equation, I'm not happy, okay? I need my, my equation sort of thing, my math thing. Um, and it is only mom uh, momentum in the x direction uh, that is uncertain, okay? Um, and I actually put a big x through this because it, um, it, it, it's a little bit too general. Or, it, there, actually this should be a subscript, but I just, I, I know this should be a subscript. It's just an easier for you to read from back there if I put it like this. Okay, so, so give me some slack on that. But um, it really is about momentum in the x direction has this uncertainty. This is, that can be zero. That can be absolutely certain. And everybody who teaches quantum mechanics knows this. Okay, I'm not like, wow, this is a brand new insight. They know this, okay? They just don't emphasize it. They just say, that's, that's the way it is. I mean, that's kind of obvious. There's nothing deep or mysterious about it. But the thing is, for me anyway, is, is that whatever explanation of uncertainty you decide to settle on, okay? Make sure you can explain both the uncertainty principle with it and the certainty principle. You should not emphasize one over the other just because everybody talks about one. You've got to settle on, on the other. Okay, so, um, well, what, what, the way it works out is that you have these operators that act on a wave function. And one of them is a derivative, in this case the momentum in the x direction, not a number like x. And yes, so if you go on to graduate school, you know you can actually reverse that situation and make momentum a number and position an operator. But either way, one is a number, the other is a bit of, of calculus. Okay, and this is not the way it's done in standard books because they would have the h bar. But remember my rule number two? Uh, three. Uh, to make this, no, four. This rule number four. Um, to make this dimensionless, gee, I don't have to do much at all. That's nice. I don't have to remember my h bars, square roots of g factors. Okay, so um, you know, now we're going to look at something called a commutator, which is basically writing these things in both orders. And then they're going to act on this function p. And so when you do that, you use the product rule, and you see that you get that cancellation going on. And um, so basically, uh, this thing ends up equaling 1. The commutator ends up equaling 1. And if you repeat this exercise with the y momentum operator, then lo and behold, you get 0. So the y x commutator acting on phi equals 0. This, again, is something they do teach you in a quantum mechanics course. 
And they say, well, yeah, I don't know. It, it, to me, they're not emphasizing it enough. Because this is purely math. It, to me, it's, it's totally clear. Uh, or it's pretty darn clear about what's going on. And I don't have to get into philosophy. I just look at my product rule and say, well, in this case, I'm going to end up with one. In this case, I'm going to end up with zero. Um, oh, but there, um, you want your h bar in there. And so I'm doing all the calculations I've mentioned in the And um, But to me, the key difference between the two is that one ends up at zero because there is no you know, product rule kind of thing going on and, uh, and one for the other. Okay, so the next time you get into a philosophical argument about the uncertainty principle, which is easy to do, you know, people feel passionate about why the heck it is that way, uh, just ask them about the certainty principle, about why, if I have that position in X and I come in at Y, now they might show, say, well, orthogonality, which actually turns out to be the right answer, okay? <laughs> but it's kind of like, it's like, it's almost like they, they change the discussion a little bit. And so I like that, I like my, my reason for why there's uncertainty is the same reason for certainty, see? So that to me is, is being consistent in my logic. And uh, so anyway, that's why I'm at peace with the uncertainty and certainty principles. All right. So we're on to uh, Schrodinger's equation. Um, All right, so Schrodinger's equation, uh, it's a scalar second order differential operator that acts on a wave function. Uh, but even though it's second order, it's actually only second order in terms of its space part, and it's only first order in terms of its time derivative. And believe me, people understand this. Okay, they, they describe it that way in, in graduate level physics books. So we're not putting a big surprise. We are going to rearrange the furniture in the house. Uh, that's essentially all that we do in this exercise. But again, I think the, the results look pretty. Now, since prettiness <laughs> is a judgment call, uh, I'm going to put that equation down at the bottom of every one of these slides. And you decide at the end whether you think it's prettier. Okay? All right. So, um, so there is the actual animal. It's got these factors of i. It's got a del squared. It's got one time derivative. Okay. Um, and so the first thing I do is I drop all my factors of i. And then I say, well, that's really a scalar operator um, because time derivative is a scalar operator. The del squared is a, a, a scalar operator. Believe me, people know this. And, but this is, again, part of my let's write everything down. Most people would say, would say I've got a scalar operator. I'm not going to bother you with that zero with an arrow over it. Okay? I understand them saving some chalk, some ink, but to me, I want that, I want to see it, okay? Because it tells me that if I want to generalize this equation a little bit more than it is right now, I can, I can act right there. I mean, there's no question of where I do something. It, it, it's sitting there on the page. So again, one of my odd things is I always write my zeros. So we're going to have a couple sidebars here. The first one is that uh, we want to make a Laplacian operator as a quaternion. And so all you have to do is really square one of those. But you get the curl of a curl. Okay? And um, it's actually not rel relevant to the Schrodinger equation. But it's nice to know that anytime you see a Laplacian, you, in the back of your mind you should go, you know, there's a curl <laughs> of a curl over here. I know you don't want to look at it because it's scary, but that's too bad. I bet nature uses that. Um, okay, so now we've got to get to one time derivative using uh, two operators, and uh, by golly, that should be easy. It's <laughs> just one times the time operator, and, and that's it. So now we take these two observations, and uh, we want to take that, uh, that scalar derivative sorry, scalar operator, and write it as two operators. And so what we see is a full derivative operator. 
we've got the dt time and then the, the, the delta, okay? And then the next one, it's unity. Oh, unity, that's got to be dimensionless. Uh, and we've got this del thing. Oh, we can actually tell right away that, that this must not no longer be like fully relativistic because you know one is a constant, okay? Um, and the, okay, so that's 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 all well and good. Um, so now let's see where, where do we go from here? Ah, all right. Let, let, let me just stay stay a moment long, longer on this one. Um, so can we see? Can we see what we need to get? We, we can see we get a the time time element out of there. Well, apparently, oh yeah, this, I've got the scalar. The scalar thing it says I'm not going to think at all about the vector part, but that means there's probably more that we could know or something. There's 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 more calculations that could be done if we didn't put that scalar constraint on. It. But since since I'm trying to get a scalar out of it, it's pretty easy to read. Okay, it's going to be the dt of t. It's going to be the second order, uh, you know, spatial derivative of phi. It's going to have uh, an h bar over 2mc. And that was actually fun seeing that that's a dimensionless number, uh, h bar over mc. So that's, that's a momentum. And um, so that's the right. um, So I want uh, more cowbell. I want more h bar. Um, so you can actually wipe out my, my units if you, if you so choose. And uh, then actually go, go ahead and, and throw it, uh, an h bar across the way, and um, you'll you'll end up with exact with the right units. Okay. See, since I wrote g h bar over c five on both sides, I mean I can I can just wipe that out, and if I multiply through by h bar, um, yeah, it, it's spot on. So that's pretty good. All right. Um, all right, so uh, I think that's it. I think that's it. That's my way of, of writing uh, the Schrodinger uh, wave equation using uh, quaternions, using dimensionless operators. Oh, and there's, there, there's that line. Nature nurtures naked numbers. <laughs> it might make a bumper sticker someday. Um, who does? All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, relativistic uh, quantum mechanics. All right, 2.6, Klein-Gordon. All right. All right, so um, we're going to get the Klein-Gordon uh, equation out of here. Um, it uses both time derivatives. Um, and we're actually going to write out the phase, uh, even though I'm not sure if it's actually used currently in, uh, in standard physics or not. Um, this is my own issue. Uh, this is the most famous equation uh, of all. I, I wrote it so big because, I mean, this really reaches out into the popular culture. You see it included in the artworks and that sort of thing. Um, but I actually think it leads a, a physicist a little bit of stray. Um, one of the things, uh, a little cultural element, um, Einstein's manuscript where he first didn't write this uh, was put up for sale and it didn't meet this, the, the, the asking price, which was, I think, about $4 million. Because what he wrote down was E equals mc squared over the square root of 1 minus b squared over c squared. And people are like, well, we don't, you know, that's, that's not equally mc squared. There's that part I don't understand. Even less than e equals mc squared. Uh, and um, I actually think that maybe that's the most important part of the equation. Um, but anyway. Um, and and the, so people emphasize this equivalence and certainly physicists know the, 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 the real correct relationship. I shouldn't say the correct relationship, the, the more general relationship. E equals mc squared for only one inertial reference frame you can come up with. And it's not generally true. You know, if you're, you're walking by somebody, 
that you're going to have a different opinion about that. Not very different, but different nonetheless. Okay, so I want to equate, only work with equations that are always true. Um, so what I do is I square this uh, four momentum, and you get that e squared minus p squared, and you get the uh, that m squared uh, uh, c, the fourth thing. And this is all I ever use, okay? And this, again, makes me rather odd. Okay, people are so at peace with e equals mc squared that, that you know, you just choose a frame where p equals zero. It's like, no, I won't do that. Because if I choose that reference frame, somebody else can choose another, and it won't quite be true. Um, and the other thing that is just, to me, the, the, the huge elephant in the room is that when I do it this way, I get this 2EP times C. That's a perfectly valid thing, okay? It's not like I've broken a math rule or something. Uh, that should be relevant with doing these calculations. And I don't think that people use that. I mean, it doesn't even have a name as far as I know. If somebody actually knows of its name, you know, please tell me and then I'll be able to read up on it. But um, I don't see it in the literature, energy times momentum. Okay, so we've got to have a couple sidebars again. Uh, we're going to convert numbers, the numbers E and P, uh, to operators. Okay, so this is, again, another little indication that we're not quite in uh, classical quantum mechanics, where we had one was a number, the other was an operator. Here, they're both uh, operators. Um, okay, and then uh, sidebar number two has to do with uh, four momentums. Um, that you can rewrite uh, energy and, and uh, momentum as this factor gamma, gamma, m times gamma is energy where gamma is the square root of, oh, that, that factor that showed up in, in Einstein's original man, manuscript. Um, and then gamma beta is the velocity times that gamma thing. All right? And so if you square this, what you end up with is you get that gamma squared times 1 minus beta squared. Well, hold it. Gamma squared is also 1 minus beta squared, so that's just unity. It's like, oh, that's another way, reason why this is such an uh, important relationship. We see unity. Unity is good. Okay, so now we uh, substitute this all in, and um, we, we go through this, this kind of process, and we say, okay, so I get a two, two time derivatives, uh, I get a, a two space uh, derivatives, and I get a time and space derivative. That's the uh, the energy momentum thing, um, and so that's just you know kind of rewriting things. And um, now I divide through by m squared, and so this is my completely dimensionless expression. And here I my my phrase I, I love uh, nature measures naked numbers. You see I, I I've got a real genuine one over there. Okay, I also have gamma squared beta in the, the phase. Uh, but I've got this time derivative, second order time derivative. Um, I've got this h bar over m. Well, this time it's a h bar over mc squared. So that's similar to what, what, what I saw in, uh, in the Schrodinger equation, if I recall. And now, is this uh, Klein-Gordon? Uh, well, actually it's not. Um, because there's a sign difference because of the way that, that standard physics uh, writes things. They throw in factors of i, the ones that I, I threw out. And so that's what it would take to, to make it more like the standard equation. Right. So now you at least know a, a way to derive the Klein-Gordon uh, equation, which shows up in quantum mechanics. All right. So again, the, you're only looking at the scalar part as the Klein-Gordon equation, right? Yes, absolutely. So the vector part does it mean something? I, I think it should, uh, okay? Is, is it, have I done any calculations with it? No, I haven't, okay? I haven't seen the consequences of it. And I am not enough of a student of, of real physics, relative to quantum field theory, to know whether they use that. It, it hasn't come across in my readings. You know, everybody's just like, here's fine, Gordon, or I've decided to use Dirac. And, you know, it's like, it, it doesn't come up. It's kind of like structurally it can't come up. 
because of the, the tools that they're using. So, so I'm thinking that they don't work with them. They might, they, they, well, that, that's where, where, where I, uh, I stand at this point on that issue. All right, so I think we only have uh, one more collection of slides. I am only subjecting you to half as much uh, brain damage today as, uh, as, as yesterday. All right, so let's see. All right, so the Dirac equation uh, squared ends up being uh, the klein gordon equation. And that's only kind of roughly true. It's not formally for all orders, but um, it's roughly what's going on. And so in, in a, in a hand-wavy way, um, this is uh, the uh, Dirac equation on top. I haven't told you what A and B are. Alpha, sorry, alpha and beta. I haven't told you what those are. Um, but we can see if we squared that, we should get a two, two, two factors of uh, time derivatives. If we square that, we should get a couple of uh, Dell operators in there. Um, but you know, we get an m squared out of that thing. If we divide through by h bar, you know, but this is all real hand wavy, you know, because I haven't said what alpha and beta are. Okay, so um, so I'm going to see whether I can get to uh, something that looks like fine Gordon and where where things work and where where they don't. Okay, so what I'm going to do is collect space time terms together. I'm going to drop all factors of i. Okay, so now I've got a time derivative and a del operator. Okay, and uh, I don't have any factors of i. So that was step was pr pretty simple. Um, I'm going to make this thing dimensionless by putting uh, the beta on the other side. Um, so I put that over there. And um, oh, but I'm really kind of re really rearranging things a bit. Um, they, they usually put the, the beta right next to the mass. And I'm saying, well, if I've got an alpha, this is a bit hand -wave. So I, it's just the nature of the way I, I'm operating at the time. Um, let's, I can, since that's just a scalar, I'll make up a new beta and, and have it multiplied by time. I'll have to you know, do something to make al sure alpha doesn't get too upset and, and, and look at it that way. And then if I now, um, if I just, trying to think about this without those alpha betas, okay? This is what I would have. I would have an h bar over mc squared del t, okay? That looks pretty easy. You know, if I square that thing, I'm going to probably end up right, right at the, the Klein-Gordon equation. So, so that's why that's good. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about spin one half, uh, because that's what makes this difficult, is, is spin one half. Um, and what I'm going to uh, argue is that we should embrace it and not fear spin one half. So um, a beer uh, in the hand, let's say I don't really have a beer, so, so why don't we just use a camera in the hand. Um, let's think about two pi symmetry. Um, so if, if I've done my, my D, I will come back to exactly where I started from. And this is two pi uh, rotation. I could do a cartwheel. If I thought more energetic, I can do a backflip. I've got three, three different ways I can do this. Okay? That was all example of two pi symmetry. I will sh same camera, I'll show you four pi symmetry. Because now I go with one twist around, and am I back to where I started? Ah, you've seen this trick before. I have to do it again. That's an example of four pi symmetry. And what is cons why is this different? It's the same camera. It's the same hand. Okay, the reason is I got a shoulder here. It's connected, okay? And uh, I think in a way it essentially constrains one degree of freedom in space. So now space is not the same, okay, because of my shoulder. It's saying I basically have one constraint on it that I, that I don't have when, I, when I'm doing here. My, my shoulder is in a constraint there. So that uh, is an example of four pi symmetry. So if, if three space somehow gets split into two and one, uh, there's the dimension with my arm and then there's the, the other thing. That's what I think four pi stuff begins to happen. All right. So um, 
Okay. Uh, and sidebar number two uh, are the gamma matrices. Now this is going to be a longer sidebar uh, because the gamma matrices are the things that make up the alpha and the beta. Okay. Uh, these can be manipulated if you're in graduate school uh, without really being understood. Okay, you can look them up, you can look I got gamma one, two, three, four, five, these kinds of things. They have these types of rules, uh, but you can't really explain it to mom. What 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 is going on here? Yes, math is happening. <laughs> okay? Math is happening, you can apply it to this, you can solve a problem. It's great. Okay? It's just what's going on? That's a, a good question. Um, so it's one nice thing about owning quaternions.com is that uh, people all over the planet, <laughs> if they do a little bit of research in, in quaternions, they sometimes stumble over my work. They communicate with me. And so there's this uh, an engineer in Mexico, and he said, you know, that the 16 gamma matrices that, that map uh, to the 16 uh, to 16 quaternion triple products. I was like, really? I mean, that's like, that at least can be summarized quickly, right? It's like a 1, I, J, K on one side, 1, I, J, K on the other, multiply them through, oh, 1 times 1 times, yeah, hey, that's going to be the same. But what happens when you start doing some of these permutations? Uh, and um, find uh, the one permutation that makes sense. We've got A, where you uh, start with uh, T, X, Y, Z, and, and up with T, X, Y, Z. Uh, whereas in B, I, if I just hit it on one side by a factor of i, I end up with minus x, t, z, minus y. So, what this little operation does is say, whatever measurement for time that you used to have, consider it now a measurement of space. And that, that measurement you made of space, now consider that going in the past in the value of the x direction. <laughs> it's like, that's really crazy. Um, and, and don't think of you know, that measurement of y as being a measurement of y anymore. Put, put it over in the z slot as long as you take the mirror re reflection of what went happen on in the y spot. And, and the same for z. It's like z is no longer z. Z is now sitting in the y spot. And it's just looking like an old, old self, except that it's y. <laughs> it's like, you've got to be insane. I mean, these are not complicated operations, are they? I mean, it's just, these are triple products. These are the simplest triple products that can form. But they're wacky. Uh, so if you hit it on both sides by at least the same letter, J and J, what it does is it takes it from, uh, from the, 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 some, some time in the future to its mirror reflection in the past. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, to its time in the past and the mirror reflection of y, but not the mirror reflection of x or z. <laughs> okay. And now if you hit it by a, a k and a j, uh, everybody ends up being negative. We get time going where space should be. We get x go, get going where y should be. And it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty insane. Um, so uh, remember that sum of all possibilities all possible histories. I think what that means, in effect here, is that we really are messing with time and space in every possible way. Um, and so this is very, very odd. It's like, so, so why is quantum field theory so hard? You know, why does Bohr's uh, you know, argument that you know, it's just impossibly difficult to understand? This might be a nice concrete reason why. I mean, I, I don't like my time going into space. I don't like my space going into my time. But if this is a, a way to represent gamma matrices that show up in the Dirac equation, which show up in quantum field theory, well, that would be a nice concrete uh, reason why. So um, this is just a little sampling I'm going to provide of uh, the talk uh, tomorrow. And um, I need it to make this whole discussion of gamma uh, matrices much more concrete. Okay, so this is uh, this is the one animation I have 
uh, this is software that, where, that I wrote, uh, that completely uh, makes sense to me. And it's funny, but it, ironic, but it's about the only one that really does. Uh, but the idea is that I have a pile of quaternions. When I mean, I mean thousands of quaternions. I sort them by time, and this is a 10 second film, a specialized 10 second film. Um, and depending on its time, that it shows where it shows up in the, in the animation. And uh, where it shows up in X, Y, and Z, I use something called point of view ray to, to draw the 3D thing. So we have uh, the animation is front and center. And we have three complex planes. The reason I drew the complex planes was I found I couldn't think about the animation very precisely because our brains really are bad at thinking about video. Um, but still pictures were much better with. So you can see it, that the first complex plane is T versus Y. So you can see it goes up. The, this one in the corner is time versus Z. So this is going backwards into the screen, into the screen. The third complex plane is um, is X, so is it going left? Uh, it's going from the left to the right. Okay. Now, in the upper corner is the uh, basically a summation of every single possible state that that yellow ball is in. Okay. I mean, I literally, you know, on a software level, I merged them. Okay, the images. Um, and so, to me, actually, that might be wave functions, which is supposed to be. This has all the information in it, is kind of what uh, people describe the wave function as. And then um, I, I'm doing random sampling uh, uh, of that. And if I do enough random samplings of it, it would recreate exactly that same thing. I think in my 10 second video, I actually, there are lots of places I don't get to, but that was a limitation of GIF uh, software. <laughs> and that's what I use here. Uh, okay, so this is. Quaternion addition. What I did was I started with one quaternion value, and I kept on adding the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. And I think you can agree that looks like an inertial observer. They're traveling at a constant velocity. But what's like, to me, profoundly cool here is that the most basic operation of quaternions addition leads to an inertial observer which is at the base of, of, of special relativity. Okay. Um, now, I think, yes, now we're going to try and understand what gamma matrices are. Okay, so what did I do to make this? I told you. All I did was I multiplied by all 16 possibilities. Okay? I took that inertial observer <coughs> that was traveling the straight line, and I said, I'm going to... I've got, let's say I've got a thousand such points. For every one of those thousand points, I'm going to go away on one side by one and the other side by one. All I end up with the same thing. One and I. One and J. One and K. One, no, that's it. <laughs> I and one. I and J. I and K. You get 16 of them. And so when you see this, you go, okay, so what's kind of happening is I've got four clusters of four. I can actually kind of see or sense the, the 16-ness of, of, of this sort of thing. And so um, now I, I kind of, um, the, yeah, so there are, four, there are four little balls coming in from four different corners. And so when, we, when Feynman says, well, you must do the sum over all possible histories, and you hear that there's these gamma matrices, and then I say, well, there's a way to do this with quaternions with all four permutations, triple product-wise. It almost starts to make sense. Almost. <laughs> I mean, I, I, don't, I don't claim that I'm just totally at peace with this. But what I'm saying is I feel like I've taken a very concrete step towards appreciating kind of more of, of, of what the gamma matrices are actually, uh, actually doing. So, um, so the, uh, the trivial, quote-unquote, trivial Dirac equation uh, 
is, is, uh, is not a triple product. Okay, so um, if I square that thing, then I end up with, um, and, 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 and squaring is okay for quaternions. I mean, there's, there's no, no, no problem with that. You see that, oh, gee, I did end up at the klein gordon when I started this exercise, I said, well, you can't really square because I haven't told you what alpha and beta are. Well, now I have told you. I'm working with quaternions, so squaring is a legal thing. I haven't broken any of the math rules. Uh, there was no uh, hand waving, and I get to exactly the, the flying work. But you say, well, you've got 16 others to do, work with, don't you? And it's like, yes. So, so if I go ahead and do those, then... Um, well, look at that. I actually get the same scale, which is good, okay? It's just that now the phase is different. And as I say, you know, I don't read people working with phase directly. Uh, I haven't read that. Uh, but it's kind of cool that now we have, it's not exactly the same thing. And, and, and maybe that's, uh, that's relevant. Um, so... Uh, I just want to say that, that quaternions in no way uh, make quantum field theory uh, simple. Um, but I'm feeling like this is a, a, a good and interesting and productive step forward. And so, so, so that's kind of uh, one of the main things that I'm, I'm doing research on, on these things. So uh, we'll end with a comic strip uh, by Lowell here. Um, it says, now the SUSY algebra closes off shell, uh, if we use the auxiliary fields, or better known as the Abu-Dhabis, are this doggy. I would uh, like to chime in, please. Yes, Susi is unnecessary. Um, and that, in fact, is, is one of the messages of my uh, work, is that um, I don't think all these super partners uh, are necessary. I don't think they will be found. And I did, just to understand the, the nature of the t-shirt and, and, the, and the research project itself, uh, we are going against uh, LHC. Uh, if LHC finds the Higgs, you'll be able to say, wow, I got this weird artifact, <laughs> this weird guy that said there shouldn't be a Higgs boson. Okay, whereas, uh, and if they find SUSY particles, the same story. M my proposal collapses. And I'm, I'm at peace with that, okay? But if two or three years down the line, they say, we still haven't found the Higgs, and the modification they'll say is, we, we haven't found the Higgs, and we're 99.2% confident that the Higgs isn't within this range. And that's how they talk. I mean, they, these guys are impressively precise folks, okay? There are already people who have said, you know, if we don't find the Higgs, that's going to be exciting because it means we've got to do new physics. And they don't know where they're going to do their new physics. I mean, they, they, they know, know they would have to do something, okay? Well, then you can, you can show them your t-shirt, <laughs> that sort of thing. And maybe uh, strike up a conversation. But those are very concrete um, aspects of, of, this, uh, of this work. So uh, I think that concludes day number two, and uh, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the girls in the classroom think he's hot. He shows up wearing the sandals with the white socks. He hears some giggling while he's got his back to the class. He thinks he's got an eraser mark on his ass. And all the girls from the hall show up to hear him talk. Even though most of the time he's covered in chalk. Math prop rock star. Right? 
Well, uh, at MIT, uh, I was a 4.0. And I think most people uh, would be really impressed with that because MIT is really a difficult place. Except that it's on a five point scale. <laughs> so, so, you guys probably know I wasn't an A student. I was actually straight B. Okay. Um, uh, but, if it were for you kids just starting out, these are my real degrees. And I didn't have just one, I got two. So you say, well, these must be very relevant, okay? Uh, Bachelor of Science in Life Sciences? <laughs> Biology? That's not mathematical physics. Uh, and uh, this one, Chemical Engineering? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oops. Didn't these things were supposed to be, you know, 7, 18? No, I said 8. 8 and 18. Hmm. No, man, maybe, maybe I got it. Maybe, maybe I should just erase that and they'll pen something in. No, no, that would, that would, that would, that would be wrong. That would be wrong. Okay, so um, let's see. Is there something else that might impress you? Well, um, I was out of work for like a year and a half. See, I, I like to deal with big abstract things, not like concrete things like making money. Uh, so I have a couple stretches of long unemployment <laughs> where I was thinking about stuff and wasn't bothered by the real world. My wife was bothered by that. But anyway, um, so I decided I would take uh, the United States Postal Service exam. And this turned out to be a very difficult exam because it's not testing your knowledge of anything. It's actually testing a bunch of little monkey tricks, mental monkey tricks. What, like how fast can you spot errors in uh, addresses? How fast can you memorize five addresses and then recite them over here? And um, I got a, a study guide and I learned that in those questions they had four numbers and always the second digit was different. And even though I knew this little secret trick, it wasn't until like three days before the exam that I figured out a way for my brain to remember it. Like if it was a rising collection of numbers, I'd say, Elm Street, <laughs> Main Street, going up and down. And I'm one of the very few people you will meet in your life who got a hundred on the United States Postal Service. <laughs> so you say, well, uh, I'd like to see your Postal Service uniform. You can't, because they have an interview process, and I failed the interview. <laughs> and he's like, how could you do that? And I was like, well, because, you know, they, they said, well, what if you have a conflict with your boss? What if you have a conflict with a customer, okay? Well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I said the same thing. I said, I, I'm going to tell them that there are laws against having concealed weapons on your person. Okay, and there are people who break those laws. That's not me. I'm not saying that. I'm just letting you know that there's some. No, uh, I actually thought I gave rational answers to this thing. I really don't know why they they did that. But I am not a postal service. Uh, I'm the, the the one postal service person who got a hundred and failed the exam. Okay, so um, oh yeah, so. So you say, a am I really uh, crazy or something like that? And it's like, um, no. We, we far prefer the word certified, okay? I don't know if you're familiar with these kinds of things, but uh, there are people who, um, who the state determines are, what is it, Santa uh, gravely disabled or dangerous, and uh, yeah, that I'm gravely dis disabled, I don't know. But this is my official certification. So please do not call me crazy. Call me certified. I'm official. <laughs> okay, anyway. So that's, that's my one piece that says I am uh, certified enough to maybe have come up with a new idea like that. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you didn't go postal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, a danger to others. That, that's a checkbox.